good morning, everybody. Welcome to the last day of DevOps. I am super happy to be here. I, this morning I woke up, did my check for equipment. Do I have the adapters? Do I have the power adapters, HDMI? And then the one thing I forgot, my belt. So my pants are slowly moving down from my hips towards my knees. So this might be the most disturbing talk you'll see all day. <laughs> So today, I'm going to talk about beautiful multi-model apps with Redis Stack. And uh, my name is Brian Semboden. That was me uh, at the beginning of the pandemic thinking, eh, this is just going to be a couple months and we'll be good. So, and this is me now, 30 pounds later. You can reach me on GitHub at BS Bowden and um, at Twitter at BS Bowden too. I work for Redis. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about Redis today, too. Uh, how many of you have used Redis? All right, so that's like 90%. How many of you have used Redis as something more than a cache? All right, so you're in the right room. I'm here to try to change your mind about the perception of Redis. So Redis, it's a remote dictionary server. But in my mind, it's more of a, whoa, this actually went really fast. Uh, in my mind, it's more of a remote data structure server. And I'm not going to use the clicker. And Redis supports uh, the familiar strings, which is what most people would use to basically cache something in Redis. Key value, you put something in Redis, you get something back. It's a blob of characters. Uh, but we also have bitmaps, bit fields. Hashes, hashes is kind of the workhorse for uh, object-oriented languages. You can typically map an object to a hash and store it in Redis. And uh, you kind of bypass a few of the layers below to get that speed. Uh, we have lists, sets, uh, sorted sets, which are pretty interesting to do things like ranges, uh, searches on ranges of things that have a value to them. Uh, geospatial indexes. Uh, Hyperlog log, which is a probabilistic data structure, and we have some more of those, and streams. So if you wanted to do something like uh, Kafka light, uh, you can do that in Redis. All right, so that is what you get with open source Redis. Out of the box, you download Redis, you get a Redis image from Docker Hub, you're going to get those data types. In Redis, it's all about having a data type and commands that work with those data types. Now, we provided an API for the world to extend Redis to add whatever you want to Redis. And we ourselves did that. So we have uh, seven modules that we are promoting right now that basically extend Redis with new data types and commands that can actually uh, actuate on those data types. Uh, JSON, it's probably the most popular. So you can basically store JSON documents, search those JSON documents, uh, modify the JSON documents, all in Redis. Uh, we have Redis Search, which basically pair with uh, Redis JSON allow you to do that searching. It's a full text search engine uh, that allows you to basically search over some specific data structures that we have in Redis. We have Redis Graph with my uh, colleague Guy uh, show yesterday, which is a graph database inside of Redis. We have a time series database, uh, a Redis AI module that allows you to run inferences in Redis. Uh, Redis Gears, which is kind of like a cloud functions for Redis. You can write a little bit of code that basically triggers something in Redis or it's triggered by something in Redis. And we have Redis Bloom, which is probabilistic data structures. Uh, for those times when you want to count a large number of things, but you don't want to keep uh, a large uh, collection of data to keep that count. So we uh, package uh, five of those modules, the five that work together really well, um, in a single offering called Redis Stack. And Redis Stack uh, mixes the JSON, search, uh, graph, time series, and Bloom into a single package. And that's what I'm going to be using today. Uh, you can get a Redis Stack uh, from Docker. Uh, there's installers for every operating system, and there's also a cloud offering that basically allows you to have a stack image of a database on the cloud. Today, I'm going to use the Docker Hub install. So now, let's rewind back to me trying to change your perception of Redis. In Redis, uh, people think, oh, it's a cache. It's in-memory cache. It's volatile. 
you know, I pulled the cord on the server, there goes my data. Well, no, it's not. Uh, Redis is just a database, just happens to be optimized to work in memory first. In uh, persistence, it's an optional uh, secondary concern, but it's still a persistent database. So keep the in memory first part in your mind. So the premise of my session is that your cache is your database. Where does the action happen when you're working with the data? In memory. If you're going to the cache more often than you're going to the database, I'm sorry to say it, but your cache just became your database. So think about the traditional uh, cache aside pattern, where you have a relational database, and to put things in the cache, you know, first you hit the, the, the cache, the thing is not there, and then you flatten or simplify something from your database to put it in the cache so you can get to it fast. And, and typically it will be some kind of JSON HTTP web services age. So again, the premise that if your cache happens to be your database, you should have a real database as your cache. So in, in my view of the world, um, your application will basically work with smart, complex data types that are needed at runtime, uh, and that's what this module ecosystem of Redis supports. Uh, JSON being one of the most popular, for example. And again, what I put here on the slide is that you, know, you, you read here mostly because performance almost always matters. Not at development time, but once you hit you know, production, then you know, the complaints begin. So uh, you can also, of course, keep your uh, relational database and have you know, your Redis cache aside plus plus. So rather than flatten those data types uh, from your relational database, you have more complex data types that you can work with. And of course, uh, in my favorite view of the world, then you will use Redis as your primary database because why not? <laughs> I'm gonna get fired. So <laughs> Redis loves Spring. Um, I I've been a Java developer since like the 90s, and uh, a Spring developer since it was I interface 21 uh, jar, it was a single jar. So the, uh, the moment that the module ecosystem started to evolve in Redis, I, I, I thought to myself, I need to do something so I can make that easier to use in Spring. So um, the DevRel team at Redis, uh, each one of us kind of took a language and created an adapter object relational mapping from entities in a language to some of the constructs and commands in the modules. So for Spring, uh, I, I started this Redis Ohm uh, Spring project that basically gets, gives you multi-model object mapping and querying uh, for Redis objects uh, expressed as Spring entities. So it extends the popular Spring Data Redis and uses uh, the Jetis um, driver for Java. And Jetis doesn't have a logo, so that's the best I could do. Uh, and it, it's a horrible name because it's very hard to Google for things about Jetis. Uh, that's my marketing gripe there. Okay, so today it's going to be mostly about basically demoing what I've, what I've uh, built in here. And we're going to do a, 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 a simple demo of a domain map uh, from hashes, uh, from objects to hashes, uh, repositories in Spring to basically search over those hashes. Then we're going to uh, move on to the more complex data type, JSON. And we're going to do the same in there, but we're going to do more complex searching in there. Then we're going to work with an API that looks like the Java Streams API for querying uh, JSON and hash objects in uh, Redis. Uh, and if, of course, this is depending on time, I'm pretty sure I can get this done. This, maybe. This is kind of dicey. <laughs> All right, so it's demo time. So I have a VS Code here. And I have, um, you guys probably saw Josh Long basically writing code like his fingers, lightning is coming out of his fingers. So I am doing not that. 
I'm doing what I call the Milli Vanilli version of live coding. <laughs> I wrote a tool in Rust that can play through the commits of my repos, and then I play through the commits and I talk about the code. And then I don't have to stress myself uh, and, and burst into flames here on stage. So, <laughs> um, so I have a Spring Boot application that I haven't even started yet. I have an empty commit in there. And now I'm gonna bring it in. And like any Spring Boot application, I have basically my basic uh, demo app. And let me make that a little bigger. Okay. So I have my basic empty uh, Spring application. Yay. So next, uh, I added basically, I'm gonna add Swagger to it because we're gonna use Swagger uh, further down in the demo. So I have my Swagger annotations and I have my docket uh, being declared down here so I can basically expose the controllers as endpoints. And then if I look at my Palm file, you will see that I've added, uh, this is a Spring 273. I'm currently upgrading to uh, Spring 3.0, just getting ready for that release. Uh, Java 17, because we're not animals. <laughs> and uh, I have here the library that basically it's the start of the show, which is the Redis Ohm Spring. Uh, we're very early release. We're in 0.6 right now. Uh, so it's, uh, it's being worked on actively. Long nights. Okay, so I'm gonna add now a plain uh, Pojo model here. And it's gonna be called Roll. And it has an ID and a name. And like any spring uh, class, we're going to, uh, <laughs> sorry Josh, I'm using Lombok because, you know, hey, I'm not that good with records yet. So I have uh, the data annotation and the builder annotation on my Roll uh, class. And then I'm going to add the annotation that maps this to a Redis hash. And this one comes from Spring Data Redis and it's called at Redis hash. And basically with that and an ID, that's all you need to map an object from Spring to Redis and back. In uh, Spring Data Redis will give you basic finders. Uh, they, it creates secondary indexes so you can find things by, by a single uh, value in your hash. Uh, so we're going to see that too, but we're going to go deeper than that. Uh, we also need a repository. So uh, for the repository, again, the familiar CRUD repository extending uh, for role uh, using a string as a primary key. And we have our repository annotation in there. And let's go back to the demo application here. We're going to see some changes happening in here. Okay, so in here, now we're gonna add uh, what we need to enable uh, Redis on Spring to work with your application. And that is one of those familiar enable blah, blah, blah annotations. We have two of those. We have an enable Redis enhanced repositories, which basically takes what the Spring Data Redis team did and it enhance, enhances it with the search capabilities of Redis Search. And then there's also one for documents, which is called enable Redis documents repository. So uh, one of the things I'm doing in here, it's also uh, using uh, base packages on the annotation because I'm gonna have a multi-model application. I wanna have one set of packages where I have hash mapped objects and another package where I have JSON mapped objects. All right, uh, add a logger, some of the trivia things. So I'm gonna create a command line runner to basically instantiate some of those raw objects, save them to the database, and then just read them right there in another command line runner so we can basically see them on, on, the, uh, on screen. So here is the skeleton to load the data. It's a command line runner called load test data. Uh, one of the things I'm doing is since I wanna run this over and over and I wanna let it restart, uh, I'm gonna check the repository to see if it's empty. And it's, if it's empty, I'm gonna do the population of the repository. And if it, it has already something in there, I don't care what, I'm just gonna skip that and just query it. So I'm gonna create an admin role in there. You can see I'm using the uh, builder from Lombok. 
uh, passing the name admin and then building it. And then I'm gonna add two more. So very, very simple uh, Mickey Mouse example. Uh, I'm gonna put those in a list. And then now I'm gonna use a repository to pass that list using the save all method to save my objects to Redis. Now while we're doing that, I'm going to also uh, bring up uh, Redis Insight, which is the GUI that we use to basically visualize things in Redis. Uh, Redis has the, the Redis CLI, which is a command line uh, super popular with, with developers. Uh, I use it pretty much every day. And this is a more graphical client too that, that has also a CLI built in. So I'm gonna start the profiler, which basically kind of peeks into what's going on in Redis. Uh, and if you can see uh, here, I have the CLI. I can say keys and see that I have nothing in there. Oh, sorry, I have to do that again. And you see there's an empty list, so there's no keys in my uh, repository. In, uh, sorry, repository, in my uh, database. And now I'm gonna go back to the code, and I'm going to also, if I already created the roles, I'm going to just bring them back from the repository using the final method, and I'm gonna display, him, uh, I'm gonna display the number of roles that are in the repository. That's you know, fairly simple. So now, if I wanted to do some searching on those hashes, I have to do something slightly different with my role model. In uh, role model. <laughs> in, uh, in this case, notice that I added an indexed annotation. And the index annotation, it, it, it will basically trigger the creation of a search index in Redis. And that search index for that specific role class, uh, it's going to index the name field as a tag field. So I can do exact match searches on that field. I, I, I couldn't do like full text searches on that one yet. Uh, there's a different annotation for that. Uh, so uh, once I have the index annotation on my object, I can uh, add a finder to the repository. So if we look at the repository, I added a finder now that basically finds uh, the first object, uh, the first role entity by first name. And this is kind of the pattern with uh, Spring Data repositories. If you use the JPA repositories, any Spring Data project, uh, the repositories basically allow you to declare uh, methods that would basically be turned into a downstream query to whatever your storage um, facility happens to be. And in our case, it's going to create a search query for Redis search that's going to search over hashes. All right, so here I'm going to now uh, switch to my Spring Boot run. And if the demo gods are with us today, this would not blow chunks. So I'm starting my um, Spring Boot app, and you should see that now we have created three roles, and we query the admin role um, by the name and pulled it out and show what the ID was. In Redis also, Redis on Spring will generate uh, the IDs for you, which are ULIDs, so a little better than UUIDs. Okay, so we can uh, create hashes, we can map them to Redis, and we can search over them. Now let's go back to the presentation for a second. All right, so now I'm going to make this a little more complex. So I'm adding a user model. And my user model, as you can see, it's a little more beefy than the role. So I have, again, uh, my data annotation from Lombok, my Redis hash, because I wanted to map it as a hash too. And I have a traditional user object with an ID. And notice that now I have a name which is searchable. Now that searchable annotation gives you full text searching capabilities uh, using Redis search over uh, those hashes. And uh, that's all I have in there. And uh, again, um, all the one to many's, uh, many to many's, we try to basically approach most of those uh, so you have a way to map more complex things into Redis hashes. Uh, given hashes have limitations, so we can see uh, as we move to JSON how you can do more complex objects. Uh, JSON really have very little limitations when it comes to mapping uh, from your object domain to the JSON. All right, so yeah, I, I did explain the searchable annotation. Thank you, Brian, for reminding me. <laughs> so another thing that I added to the... Uh, to basically be in line with spring uh, data projects, it's audit fields. 
So when you create hashes or JSON uh, in Spring mapped to Redis, you can have a created date and a last modified date, and also uh, auditing for the user that did that too. So in this case, I'm only doing the dates right here. Uh, but that's basically all you need. And these are the familiar annotations that come from Spring Data. This is not, uh, we try to basically ride on the great job uh, that the Spring Data team has done and only add new things when necessary. Okay, so now let's add a user repository. And in my user repository, that almost sounds like user suppository, which is not what I mean, but I do have an accent. <laughs> so here's my repository, very simple, empty repository. Um, and uh, it's, again, CRUD repository will give you all the CRUD methods that you need. We'll see later uh, some more uh, enhanced repositories that have uh, more methods than those provided only by CRUD or the paging and sorting uh, repository. So back to the application, uh, I added a skeleton to basically load the users. And the users are coming from a JSON file. So, you know, they tell you never to load live data on a presentation while well, I'm doing that. So if it goes poorly, it's on me. So let me show you the, the, uh, the file. It's actually very small in this case. So I have a user's JSON file that I generated with some online uh, fake user generator. And uh, you can see there's a few users in there with a password, name, and email. So no salting of the passwords, who needs that? <laughs> All right, so um, the next thing I'm adding there to my user object. So here in my, uh, one second. Yes. So in my user object, notice that I have an email and the email now has a bloom annotation. So Bloom, it's a annotation that basically will create a Bloom filter for that specific uh, field for that object. And what a Bloom filter does, it's count things efficiently. So imagine that you have, you know, let's say that uh, my application is super successful and I have a billion users. <laughs> and I want to check whether an email has been taken. So rather than having to query a SQL database over a potentially massive collection of uh, uh, rows. Instead, the Bloom filter can tell you whether something was added to the collection or not in linear time. So if you're doing searches over something that you wanted to count, but you don't care of keeping the actual thing to count, uh, a Bloom filter can give you a very efficient, it's also a fixed uh, size in memory and fixed uh, time to retrieve that response, whether the email was in the system already or not. So that's what we're doing there. We're doing a Bloom filter, and there's some parameters to configure how you want the Bloom filter in case, because you know, past a certain point, you would have to resize it. So you want to basically do some math to calculate how, uh, what the capacity of it would be, and what the error rate. And the error rate, it's one of those things that people go like, wait, what do you mean? There's an error rate for counting things? Yes, it's a probabilistic data structure. That means that sometimes, most of the time, it's going to be correct, but it's a very, very, very small chance determined by that error rate that it will give you a false positive. Or, or yes. So in that case, uh, it will tell you, yeah, the, the email, it's, uh, it doesn't exist, and then you will go uh, and hit the database again, and it will be the same thing that, you know, it, you will basically do a trip to the database just because the counter kind of fail you on that specific uh, event. But for scaling applications, uh, Bloom filters are basically uh, a work of beauty. All right, so now in my application, I'm going to basically load the users. So this is a big chunk of code, um, basically loading stuff from that users of JSON, and I'm using JSON to basically turn that into a list of users, and then I'm gonna loop over that, uh, add random roles to it, and save the users to the database. So this should probably already be happening in here. So notice that we have created 1,000 users in our old code, you know, ran again. So now 
we're going to add some finders to the user repository. So if you look in the repository now, I added something a little more complex. This one is searching over a, the name field, but it's using a full text search because we created that full text search index field uh, by using the searchable annotation. So I can say find by name starting with and pass some prefix. Now in my demo application, I'm going to test that by basically using the user repository in invoking the find by name starting with and putting the letters MIC and then printing the list of users that I get from that. And if we go back to their Spring Boot run um, screen, you can see that I have found uh, four users, uh, Michelle, Michael, Michelle, and another Michelle. So uh, searches in Redis with Redis search are incredibly fast. Uh, so if there's something, like for example, let's say you have session information and you want to keep that in a more um, uh, manageable, runtime manageable way, JSON might be a good um, way to do that. And then you can search over those sessions to find things at runtime uh, and not later on you know, running Spark jobs uh, 24 hours later. So uh, the ability to bring the computation to where the data uh, is, it's basically the main point of having these complex data structures that can allow you to basically ask questions of your data at, at, the, at the moment and place where it matters most. All right, so back to my Milli Vanilli. So now we're going to uh, add the index annotation to the user email. So in here are the user email now. Notice you can basically stack some of these annotations. I have an index creation, I have a bloom filter creation, all on the same email field. And then in my user repository, now I can add my bloom filter finder. So in this case, I have uh, the find, uh, oh, sorry, this is the find first by email. So this is just the finder for the email. And I'm going to also test it here. So notice that I have my find first by email passing uh, this email that happens to be in the collection. And if we go back to the output of the uh, running, hold on, maybe I haven't gone far enough. No, I did. Sometimes you have to play dirty with the spring reloading. Okay, so we should see the testing of that last method at the end of that uh, output. So I'll find my users, there are a thousand users, and let's see. What was that thing I told you about not loading data during a demo? <laughs> okay, so found the user and I'm waiting for... Hmm. Let's assume that I changed the data and that's why it's not working, but... <laughs> and I should distract you now, my pants are just went down about two inches, so... Okay, so now I'm gonna transition. We should see that happening at some point in time. I don't know why a Spring is not picking it up. But now I'm going to do uh, a mapping from a entity in Spring to JSON documents in Redis. So the uh, first thing that I have in here, it's something called a fictional, fictional character. So let's see, under my JSON folder, I have my fictional character. And the fictional character has, uh, it's already, I already pre-mapped it so we can move faster through this. But my fictional character, it's a class that it's mapped with the at document annotation. So if you use Mongo, I kind of went with the same name because JSON documents, that seems to be you know, in people's mind. So if you want to map a Redis object 
uh, a Spring object to a JSON uh, Redis document, you use the add document annotation. It just happens to be our annotation. And again, we have an ID. We have an index ID, so you can choose to index your IDs if you want to, uh, to do specific things with that. I have index fields all over the place for the first name, last name, uh, the age of the actor. Uh, I have a full text search capabilities over the quote field. Uh, I have a, notice this is a point. So this is a geo point in Spring. You can actually map that to Redis JSON or Redis hashes. And you can also create searchable fields over those geo locations. So in this case, I just use the index annotation and it knows by the data type how to deal with it, the index creation. And I have also uh, an address. And here, it's uh, another interesting thing. I have a set of strings that happens to be skills and that's also mapped with the index annotation. So I can map sub objects uh, in the graph of objects that I have. Okay, so now, we have also a repository, and the repository for this is going to be a little more involved than the one that I shown you before. So if I go to my JSON repositories, I have the fictional character rep repository, and now I'm gonna start adding things to it that should basically give you a, a more of a global picture of what the searching capabilities are with uh, Redis Search. So you can do something like this, find people by age range, and I can basically use the spring um, uh, basically naming conventions to create a range finder. So I can say find by actor age between uh, minimum age and maximum age. I can also do things like find people by their first and last name. So I can say uh, in spring, again, you just say N in the name of the two fields. I can do a, a geo radius search. So I can say find by actor, uh, actor location near a specific point in a distance around that point. I can do a full free text search over the quote field by saying search by quote. And we also have, I added a basically plain search method that will do free text search over all the searchable annotated fields in a class too. So if you wanna do like, find this word anywhere on anything that I actually made uh, searchable, that will work too. And uh, tag searches, uh, for example, on a sub object. So, so since we have an address object that it's inside of the fictional character, let me show you that again. Uh, here, it's an address object in my address object is another uh, object that doesn't have to be mapped. It's just basically hanging on off the uh, fictional character, but it has index fields. So when we map this to the database, we also have the ability to create search indexes over those subfields. So in here I have the house number, it's uh, searchable uh, by exact value, and I have the uh, street being searchable full text search. So then in our repository, where did it go? Oh, mm -hmm. Maybe I didn't keep it open. Fictional character repository here. So in my repository, I can do things like find by actor address underscore city so I can navigate into that sub field of the address to basically do the match. And in here, now I'm adding a few more. Uh, you can find, uh, remember we had that set of strings in there. I can do a search by skills, which are a collection of strings. And I can do things like find uh, any of the fictional characters containing this set of skills or find the ones that contain all of this set of skills. So there's uh, a lot of different operators uh, that in predicates that you can basically use to do very exact uh, searching and really minimize the round trip uh, to Redis, in, uh, which is incredibly fast to begin with. But again, we wanna squeeze every ounce of performance out of everything. So now to enable this multi-model world that, that we created in here, in my application now, I need to add another enable 
repositories annotation. In this one, it's called enable Redis document repositories. And notice that I basically use the base packages to discern where the hashes are and where the JSON is. So now I'm gonna basically load my fictional character uh, data. And in here, basically, I have some of the quotes. Uh, I stole this from basically Marvel movies. So I can do some searches over those quotes. And I have six characters in there. Thor, Iron Man, Black Widow, Wanda, uh, Gamora, and Nick Fury. And I have addresses that I randomly picked from around the world, uh, except for Thor's address, which I actually purposely placed it near his house in Australia, which I don't know if that's stalking, but. <laughs> so in here, I basically build my fictional characters. I add them to a list like I did before, call the save all in the repository, and then I basically show how many fictional characters were created uh, and how many there are if I already did the loading. So let's see if uh, this actually decided to behave. Yes, yeah, so notice in here, I have my six fictional characters created. I still don't see that email for the, uh, <laughs> for the dude. Um, all right, so I have my fictional characters created. And now, let's actually do some interesting things to them. Oh, and I, I, I forgot, uh, I probably missed this. But as we were basically doing all of that stuff in the Redis profiler, you can see all of the stuff that was happening behind the scenes. And maybe somewhere in here, I can... So here's one of those searches. Basically, it's an FT search command um, against Reddit search, uh, basically targeting that user collection. And let me uh, stop the profiler so I can see things. And what I wanted to show you, though, it's... Uh, so here's, for example, the JSON being created. Uh, let me make that a little bigger. I don't know if it's big enough for you guys. But you can see, um, well, here is the index creation. So you can see uh, it's all squished up in here, but uh, you can see that I'm creating a, a schema. And there's the different tag fields, the separators for specific tag fields, uh, and all the uh, JSON path notation to index those specific fields in the JSON. Uh, here's the quote being indexed as a text field. Here's the actor location being indexed as a geo field. Um, so basically, you get you know free index creation. Uh, we were work we're working on the index migration and maintenance. That's going to be a, 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 a tougher coconut to open. Cat to fry? I don't know. I get my uh, analogies always mixed. All right, so uh, in here, back to the presentation, I, wrote it the fictional, I, I loaded the fictional characters, and now I'm gonna add a controller. So my controllers are up here, and I have a repository-driven controller. And I, I'm, I called it that because it's being driven by Spring Data Dynamic Repositories. And I have another way to do this too that if I have enough time, I'll show you. But in my um, repository-driven controller, basically I have simple mapping of the, what I have uh, in the repository to uh, the controller. So very simple, all goes to find all, uh, find by ID, um, by ID goes to find by ID, H between goes by H between, et cetera, et cetera. So here's all my finders. And now let's actually look at my cheat sheet of data and uh, so in Swagger, let me reload my UI in here. Let's maximize this. All right, and I have my repository driven controller. And by ID, so let's actually look at an ID. Uh, so if I refresh this, I should see some of the keys that are in the system now. So let's go to the fictional character a set of keys, and I can open one of these, and oh, guess what, my friend. So I'm gonna grab the ID for Chris Hensworth, and I'm going to now go to my, oh, I've had to. Why does Swagger makes you click the try out? 
it should just always be on by default. All right, I'm gonna put the ID there. Let me remove the quotes and I'm gonna execute that and I get my JSON back. So again, this is, and, and think about it, I'm, I'm the munging of JSON through the controllers, it, or I'm minimizing the number of conversions that happen to my data uh, to get to the point that I need it. So in this case, I have my um, JSON payload. Let me make that a little bigger. And uh, you can see that the location, it's uh, expressed in a way that Redis search basically can, can, uh, can understand it. Um, but other than that, it's a very simple, here's my set of skills. Uh, one of the skills is biceps. <laughs> Doesn't say much for him, but hey. Um, okay, so now let me uh, show you some of the other methods in here. We got 10 minutes, we're doing great. Okay, so now let's try the H between. So this one, it's a range finder. And this time, uh, when we do this, I'm going to turn the profiler back on again. So we can see what happens when we do that search. And I remember 3037, okay. So the upper value is gonna be 37, and this one's gonna be 30, so I can get a, a known set of values. And notice in here I get a payload that has two JSON objects. Uh, one it's uh, Scarlett Johansson and the other one it's Elizabeth Olsen. And if we look in Redis Insight, here is the search query that basically resulted from that. So Redis, uh, sorry, uh, Redis Search has a specific query language very similar to most of the search engine uh, query languages. Um, but we're doing all the creation of the queries behind the scenes through the repositories. So let me do a couple more of these and then I'll show you the entity, um, the entity way of searching, which I, I find it the most rewarding one. Okay. All right, so entity streams. Um, and that's a name that I gave the API because for lack of a better name, I wanted an, an API that was similar to um, the Java Streams API, but that uh, would allow you to search fluidly over um, JSON and hash objects mapped in Spring. So let me show you what that looks like. So here is my Entity Streams controller. And ignore the, I haven't set up this to basically pick up the generated code, but um, one of the things that you do is you declare an Entity Stream which is uh, from the entity stream package, uh, the stream package in uh, spring ohm search package. And with that, you can do something like this. You can say an entity stream of fictional character. And then that same query that we did uh, dynamically with the spring repositories, you can do manually. So you can have more control of things. We all know that spring repositories uh, work great when you have like maybe two, three fields. But once things get more complex than that, then you would have you know, a, a 30 mile long method name. Um, and it's really easy to break in. So in this case, with this API, you can basically say, I need an entity stream of fictional characters, and I'm gonna filter that by the actor age between min and max, and I'm gonna sort that in ascending order, I'm gonna limit that to 100, and I'm gonna collect that to a list. So if you use uh, Java streams, you can use this API to do much more precise or customized searching. Now, the, uh, you might be asking, what is this fictional character dollar? We can parse, yet parse uh, lambdas in Java to get all the precise you know, AST that you could use to manipulate this. So on the meantime, I have to generate meta classes that basically have those operators and fields for the things that you uh, label as index or as searchable. Um, and I expect that in, you know, uh, maybe Java, I don't know which one, 20 something, uh, <laughs> I'll be able to have full Lambda parsing. I haven't researched when that's gonna happen. Um, unfortunately, the .NET folks can do it, which makes me really, really angry because we've been ahead of the game um, most of the time. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this is the way that it works right now, and it works fairly well. I mean, um, the only thing that can get co be confusing is that sometimes you have to tell Maven to basically, hey, here are my generated sources, please make them part of the path. Um, but other than that, that is basically what you get 
uh, from, uh, from Redis own spring. And this on top of Redis stack allows you to have this multi-model world. Uh, let me go back to these slides. So I did put some, some slides in there uh, about what we did. So you can look at them when I put the PDF uh, on Twitter. But now, yeah, I also have an autocomplete. Uh, Redis search has an autocomplete uh, specific feature. So you can basically build an autocomplete with one annotation on one field. Super easy. Uh, the final project is going to be on, uh, is on that uh, URL. Uh, the library, Redis Home Spring, it's under the Redis repository. Uh, there's a bunch of tutorials for Redis Stack, which is, again, that collection of Redis modules that basically give you much more advanced data types in, in operations. Um, the amazing Spring Data Redis project, obviously, it's what we're based on. And the Jedis driver that we use to talk to Redis, to talk to those new command uh, modules, uh, it's, it's Jedis. Uh, please come visit us at Redis Developer. Uh, all the developer advocates, we basically write articles and, and, and hang them there. Uh, and anything that we basically are playing with or discover, we try to put something out there. Uh, we also have Redis University, where if you want to become a Redis ninja, uh, come join us and uh, learn a little, little more about Redis. And uh, <laughs> if you use this, don't use guys, uh, Guy Royce's code from yesterday. Use my code. Uh, because Guy is already super famous and popular and likable, and I'm not so much. So use my code, please, <laughs> to try Redis Cloud. And, uh, and that's all I have for you guys. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Indeed, you can do uh, very complex searches. Anything that something like Elastic would allow you to do, you can do with Redis Search. You can do ranges. Uh, you can even do like, uh, like sounds-like uh, elements. Uh, pretty much anything that a full-fledged search engine will allow, it's there. And we haven't mapped everything to the repositories, uh, but on that Entity Streams API, I've tried to put everything that we support. You can get rankings and you can get highlighting on your searches. Yeah. So if you do in a full text search, you can get basically the highlights of where the things were found. So you're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, yes. <laughs> Well, I mean, this is basically about a search. There's different, um, there's different guarantees on different data types. Um, on, on, I mean, again, let me recap some stuff that most people know, but it might be uh, not so obvious. Uh, every operation on Redis is atomic. So basically, uh, Redis is a single threaded environment where a command basically blocks that main thread does his thing and gives you the, the, the results back. Um, with search, we do some basically threading to do some interesting things in there. But um, I, I believe that your search results are guaranteed to the data. And if, if not, you might be able to wrap it with a transaction. So in Red, Redis has the concept of a transaction. So you can basically say, watch this specific collection of keys. Uh, and if something changes, then abort this command. So the same thing might, might apply to search. I haven't tried it, though, but. For, for the searching? So uh, in, in, I mean, there, there's, you know, we have uh, our basically our cloud product or Sentinel, or uh, um, they basically deal with that. Uh, and you have 
uh, key slots in, in ranges of keys that map to different nodes. And a coordinator basically makes sure that, you know, that that happens in the right order uh, in, in the most atomic possible way. Any other questions? Yes. Say that again. Persistence. Yeah, persistence. Uh, Redis is a persistent database. Uh, all you have to do is basically flip a switch and, uh, and your database persists to disk. Uh, we have something called uh, a pen-only file, AOF, and also RDB, which is a Redis dump. And it's very similar to Cassandra, where you basically have a log uh, that you write in basically all the commands that arrive. Uh, and then you have a binary blob that represents the current state. And then when the database, uh, if it goes down and comes back up, the blob gets loaded and that append-only file gets replayed over that blob. And now you have a new blob that has the new current state as of when that node went down. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you being here. Mm -hmm.